Hello, my name is Eric Namet, and this is a talk that I gave at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles, California on May 13th, 2013. Art Appreciation, an Emerging Political Economy of Artworks in the 21st Century. Creativity inspires artistic movements, but what causes innovation in the art market? Exchange of art within and between cultures has a long history. Civilizations, empires, and nations have shared artworks in diplomacy and plundered cultural treasures in conquest from antiquity to the present. The commercial aspect of the transfer of artworks has, however, evolved as the gradual development of the art market over the last few centuries has enriched the political economy of cultural exchange. In this case, political economy refers to interconnection of the art market and a shifting balance of global power. Over the past decade in particular, cultural treasures have taken on new significance in the East-West and North-South relations, and emerging economies now have a substantial presence in a truly global art market. Transcultural appreciation of artworks and the potential of art as a financial investment create an opportunity, if not a need, for science and technology to innovate in deciphering aesthetics and assessing market value. Studies in neuroaesthetics and art indices represent a start in understanding the political economy of art. As a software engineer and vision scientist, I'm fascinated by systems, but my interest is not limited to technology and the life sciences. For example, diplomacy and the art market integrate to form an intriguing system. From the perspective of technology, I have an appreciation for the role of the internet in the integration. And with insight into the human visual system, I anticipate that studies in neuroscience will inform the creation and global influence of art. I first started looking at the significance of the art market in international affairs in 2001 as a distraction from science and technology. Over the following decade, the art market developed dramatically and the politics and protection of cultural property took on new dimensions. These three figures serve as reference points for the developments. The pie chart shows a rough division of annual global spending on art. In 2011, China had the largest share, followed by the United States and the United Kingdom. As a percentage of the market, China's interest in art appears disproportionately large when compared against gross national product. The image of the card players by Paul Cezanne represents the significance of art in foreign relations in that the royal family of Qatar purchased the painting in 2011 for $250 million. An Arab nation not only acquired a symbol of Western culture, but also paid the highest price ever for an individual work of art. This combination of images below illustrates a relationship between art and regional security. In 2001, the Taliban demolished the giant statues of Buddha in the Bamiyan Valley of Afghanistan. The Taliban targeted the religious symbols in an attempt to garner the support of Muslims worldwide. The violence was purely symbolic through the destruction of a monument and there was no loss of life from the act. Each of the figures represents a different dimension of the political economy of the art market. Political economy is an interdisciplinary concept that includes not only a number of different disciplines, such as finance, diplomacy, and security, but also requires considering the interrelation of disciplines. How does one discipline influence the other? Is the influence positive or negative? And what is the overall effect of the interaction between the disciplines? Each of these dimensions has a representation in the art world. The art market represents finance and commerce. Paintings and antiquities are what UNESCO refers to as types of cultural property, which has a role in foreign relations. And theft, forgeries, looting, and vandalism are types of crime that threaten the security of art. As a software engineer and vision scientist, 
I'm not an expert in art history, international relations, or criminology, but I do have a sense of how systems work, and I thereby have the benefit of an outside perspective on the interrelation of the three dimensions. I started by looking at how the transnational commercial transfer of artworks increases the significance of cultural property in foreign relations, and how the value of artworks motivates art crime. Similarly, I have observed how the political importance of cultural property has influenced the market value of artworks and the value of monuments as targets of political violence. I have also considered how theft and forgeries have increased the risk of investing in art and how looting of antiquities and wartime destruction of monuments has expanded the role of cultural property in foreign policy. The figures that I showed illustrate the interactions. China's emergence in the art market takes on a political slant in that some of the investment is going towards reacquiring Chinese paintings and antiquities from abroad to reclaim Chinese cultural heritage. In acquiring the card players to establish Qatar as a cultural center, the royal family also set a record in the art market for the highest price paid for an individual artwork. The demolition of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban exploited the symbolic value of, of the statues to garner political support from Muslims worldwide. In my research, I've examined the development of each dimension and observed interactions between the dimensions. Over the past half century, the art market, the politics of cultural property, and art crime have each increased in scope and intersected with one another to create the political economy of the art market. I will give you a sense of the development of each dimension from World War II to the year 2000, and then I will show how their integration has intensified in the first decade of the 21st century. The development of the art market is illustrated by the international expansion of Sotheby's auction houses. From the original building in London to New York in 1955, Los Angeles in 1967, Paris in 1967, Hong Kong in 1973, and Moscow in 1988. With 90 locations in 40 nations, the development of Sotheby's reflects the geographic spread of the art market since World War II. In that time, the international art market has grown to as much as $60 billion and collecting is now not only a matter of connoisseurship, but also a matter of investing. In fact, specialized indices have been developed to track the value of art. For example, the My Moses Index tracks the value of fine art traded internationally, and the graph indicates that over the past 50 years, the value of art has kept pace with the Standard & Poor's 500 Index. The increasing investment potential of art has been paralleled by the developing political clout of cultural patrimony. A prime example of the role of artworks in politics is the case of the Parthenon marbles. At the beginning of the 19th century, Lord Elgin of Scotland had various artifacts removed from the Acropolis in Athens. Over the past two centuries, the collection of marble artifacts came into the possession of the British Museum in London and Greece has consistently petitioned for the return of the artifacts. In that time, nations established domestic and international legal instruments to protect artworks and sites of cultural significance during wartime with varying degrees of success. For example, the Libor Code was established during the Civil War in the United States and the Rurik Pact was signed by 21 member states of the Pan American Union in 1935. But the scale of looting and destruction of World War II marked a turning point. During the war, the United States formed the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives section of the Army, known as the Monuments Men. Men and women of the section sought out, recovered, and saw to the return of artworks that had been plundered by Nazi authorities. For example, Leonardo da Vinci's Lady with an Ermine was secured from the home of a Nazi official in Bavaria and returned to Krakow, where it is now on display in the Czartoryski Museum. 
Joseph Stalin also had Soviet troops loot Germany as reparation for destruction and looting of Slavic cultural property. Stalin's trophy brigades included art historians who saw to the securing and transport of material to Russia. The operations were not restricted to artworks. For example, an entire altar of the ancient Greek city of Pergamon was removed from Berlin and transported to the Hermitage Museum. The altar was returned to Soviet-occupied Berlin in 1958. Returns continued throughout the Cold War era. Initially, Russia believed that artworks acquired during the war would raise the status of national museums, such as the Pushkin in Moscow, to world-class stature. But knowledge of the plundered material, such as Raphael's Sistine Madonna, tainted the Pushkin. Consequently, after Stalin's death, Russian authorities decided to return the painting to Dresden in 1955. The large scale of destruction and plunder in Europe during World War II motivated the establishment of the Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property in the event of armed conflict in 1954. The so-called 1954 Hague Convention requires states parties to secure historic structures and sites of cultural heritage from damage during wartime and to prevent looting of museums, libraries, and movable cultural material. To date, the 1954 Hague Convention has 125 states parties. While only ratifying the convention in 2009, the United States has acted to protect cultural property prior to signing the convention. In 1954, the Hague Convention led to a pragmatic role for artworks and monuments in foreign policy. Diplomatic success in restitution of fine art, however, belied our crime of the Cold War era. While wartime plunder was being returned, looting of cultural artifacts in nations of Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia emerged as a problem. Archaeological discoveries and excavation in nations such as Peru, Mali, Cambodia, and Jordan created awareness of the cultural significance of developing nations but also created opportunities for trafficking in cultural material. Demand from so-called collecting nations fueled an international market that threatened the cultural heritage of nations without the wherewithal to secure cultural sites. In response, in 1970, UNESCO established a convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. To date, the convention has 122 states parties. Just as the 1954 Hay Convention created a link between artworks and security, the 1970 UNESCO Convention illustrates the interconnection of markets, politics, and security in the art world. The convention also made the political economy of the art market independent of armed conflict, such that nations could invoke claims to cultural property that had been transferred during peacetime. An early example is artifacts that were smuggled from Asia Minor in the 1960s and which Turkey then recovered from the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Korun treasure, or Lydian hoard, comprises hundreds of artifacts dating from the 17th, 7th century BC. A Turkish journalist discovered the pieces in a catalog of the Met in 1984 and succeeded in raising awareness for a case in 1987. The Met conceded in 1993 to return the artifacts, which the museum had purchased for more than $1 million. The case of the Lydian Horde neatly illustrates the political economy of the art market. Transnational cooperation in archaeological discoveries created an interest in collecting the cultural patrimony of emerging nations. The market value of cultural artifacts created a security risk for nations such as Turkey. Consequent looting during the Cold War era motivated the establishment of the 1970 UNESCO Convention for international cooperation on protection of cultural property. Turkey subsequently leveraged the intent of the 1970 UNESCO Convention to challenge the Metropolitan Museum of Art over objects which had been acquired through the art market. With this paradigm in mind, I will provide examples of each dimension since the year 2000. 
I will start with art crime, then cover cultural property, and finish with the art market. Each of the three dimensions has intensified in the past decade. Over the past decade, art crime has taken a number of new forms in response to the increased political clout and market value of cultural property. In, two, in 2001, the Taliban demolished the giant statues of Buddha in the Bamiyan Valley of Afghanistan. In 2003, following military intervention in Iraq, satellite imagery captured progressive looting of cultural artifacts across the nation. The lucrative nature of trafficking in antiquities captured the attention of organized crime, which in turn facilitated a market for looted objects. Organized crime also ventured into fine art with a rash of thefts throughout the past decade. In combination, looting of antiquities, theft of fine art, and other types of art crime contribute to a multi-billion dollar annual market as estimated by the FBI and Interpol. The law enforcement agencies have responded with specialized services and collaborations. For example, the FBI formed the Art Crime Team in 2004, in part to track objects looted from Iraq and earlier in the decade. A joint interrogation between FBI and Spanish police successfully retrieved a multi-million dollar trove of paintings for an heiress in Madrid. As another example, police tracked a painting that was stolen from an estate in Ireland to a drug deal in Istanbul. The painting was serving as collateral in an exchange of heroin. In addition to collateral and drug deals, artworks play a role in money laundering schemes and are used as diversions in drug trafficking. For example, in Latin America, drug smugglers include religious effigies in shipments to play, play on the superstitions of customs officials. From targeting of cultural symbols in political violence, to exploiting cultural artifacts and drug trafficking, to profiting from art theft and antiquity smuggling, the threat of non-state actors in the post-Cold War illustrates the integration of cultural property and art crime. While art crime has tightened international cooperation on preventing trafficking, the politics of cultural property have created new sources of friction in foreign relations. With the end of the Cold War and increased access to the former East Bloc nations, repatriation claims from World War II exercised the intent of the UNESCO conventions. Italy and Greece secured the return of objects from the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. In 2006, the Getty agreed to return over 20 objects to Italy, including this gold funerary wreath from the 4th century BC. The Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York was also challenged and in 2006 agreed to the return of several objects, including the Euphronius Crater to Italy. And in 2009, the Cleveland Museum of Art agreed to hand over 14 objects of tainted provenance to Italy. Returns were not restricted to easily movable objects. In 2003, Italy began the process of returning the obelisk of Axum to Ethiopia. Italy obtained the obelisk in the 1930s as a war trophy, but agreed to a UN resolution of 1947 to return the monument. The delay was blamed on funding issues, but the timing seemed convenient relative to Italy's own claims of repatriation against US museums. The series of returns of plundered objects seemed to inspire long-standing claims for repatriation of cultural patrimony. A good example is, is the success of Peru in securing the return of Inca artifacts from the Peabody Museum at Yale University. The objects had been professionally excavated and legally transferred by Hiram Bingham at the beginning of the 20th century. In 2010, Yale signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Peru for the return of the objects. The potential to retrieve cultural property of historic significance emboldened nations to leverage claims to gain a voice in foreign relations. As an example, Turkey has made claims against several museums in the United States for the return of objects that broadly fell within the reach of the Ottoman Empire and may not even have been looted. This 5,000-year-old Cycladic statuette is the 
is in the Cleveland Museum of Art and is one of the odd, many, many objects that Turkey seeks to reclaim. Returns also expanded into the private sector with claims for restitution. Artworks that had, been trans, that had transferred ownership in Austria during World War II became subject to investigation. In 2006, Randy Schoenberg succeeded in retrieving several paintings by Gustav Klimt from the Republic of Austria for M Maria Altman of Los Angeles. On return, all of the paintings were sold, and this one, Portrait of Adele Bloch Bauer, set a record for the most expensive painting at over $135 million at the time. What makes it remarkable is that paintings by Klimt had previously sold for at most $40 million. A tripling of price suggests that the wartime tainted provenance and the transnational legal battle influenced the perceived value and thereby illustrated an intersection of the art market, cultural property, and plunder. As another example of interrelation, the statue of a mythic warrior from Cambodia was noticed in the Sotheby's auction catalog in 2011. Officials from Cambodia suspected that the statue had been looted in the 1970s and requested that Sotheby's withdraw the item from auction. Subsequently, United States attorneys and agents of the Department of Homeland Security assisted in securing the statue and stood ready to act on behalf of the Cambodian claim for repatriation. So claims are not only based on repatriating looted cultural patrimony, but also on private restitution for wartime plunder. And the visibility of objects in auction catalogs and museum exhibitions over the internet increases the likelihood of discovery of suspect objects. The success of Peru may inspire African nations such as Nigeria to retrieve cultural patrimony that was removed during colonial times. And as more cases for repatriation succeed simply on the basis of geographic origin of the artifacts, Greece's vigilance in the, in the Parthenon marbles may eventually pay off. In any case, the dramatic increase in reclaiming artworks and antiquities over the past decade began with objects from looting and wartime plunder and has developed into nationalist claims for cultural patrimony. At the same time, the financial value of the artworks themselves increases in interest in claims. The third dimension of the political economy, the art market, has expanded in the past decade and, as a result, has increased the political clout and security risks of cultural property. Headlines have been exciting for art sales, which have been breaking records. In February 2012, reports confirmed the sale of Cezanne's The Card Players, which set a new record for an individual work of art. Jackson Pollock's number five held the record at $140 million in 2006, until the royal family of Qatar purchased The Card Players for $250 million in 2011. More recently, the sale of Edvard Munch's The Scream set a new record for an individual work sold at auction. Pablo Picasso's Nude, Green Leaves, and Bust held the record at $106.5 million in 2010 until the Scream sold for nearly $120 million in May of 2012. The record sales illustrate a worldwide interest in a $10 billion plus auction market for fine art with China capturing a majority share. Despite transnational collecting, works by Chinese contemporaries of Picasso had a higher turnover for the first time in 2011 and have given Western artists something to worry about. Among other emerging economies, India's art market has expanded by 20 times over the past decade, and Bangladesh had its first contemporary art fair in April of 2012. African nations are encouraging aspiring contemporary artists as well, and Latin America is considered as undervalued in the new art economy. The record-breaking prices and global spread of the art market have been dramatic in the past decade and have, been, have inspired discrete analyses of types of artworks in comparison with other investments. Here, post-war art appears to have started to outperform the Standard & Poor's 500 index. The potential of art as an investment has motivated tracking of individual artists, 
almost like individual stocks against the overall market. But the prices and market only reflect development through traditional means, namely auction and private sales. A number of other developments in the past decade have introduced a new set of financial, legal, and commercial parameters in the equation of the political economy of art. Favorable financial returns on art have increased the interest in art as an investment. In addition to purchasing individual works, investors can buy into art funds and even own shares in, in individual works. While such instruments are still largely for the wealthiest investors, the development of contemporary art in emerging nations has created a new market that is financially accessible to a broader range of investors. Laws that entitle artists or their heirs to receive royalties on resale of their works have previously existed, such as in California. And at the beginning of 2012, the United Kingdom passed similar legislation. In the legal realm, an art insurance firm has ventured into art title insurance to guard against restitution claims. And the market for specialized art insurance itself is expanding in response to new risks. For example, art collectors who treat their acquisitions as investments store artworks in free ports to minimize taxes. In turn, the risk for insurance firms increases with high concentrations of irreplaceable assets. Not to forget about the internet, online art auctions are appearing at a rapid pace, and one report claims 200 online galleries worldwide. The online venues also offer web-enabled features, such as automated matching of collector interests to listed artworks. Auctions and auction results online have enabled specialized industry indices for tracking works by movement and even by individual artists. The availability, if not abundance, of contemporary art has made art rental services feasible. In one case, a Netflix-like service allows customers to sample artworks with the option to purchase. The preceding analysis identifies trends and detects interactions that create the political economy of the art market. But I would like to take a moment to talk about prediction. It's clear that finances, politics, and security of art are becoming intertwined in new and interesting ways. And technology provides a means to monitor developments. But it would also be helpful to anticipate developments. In that vein, I offer the following perspective, no pun intended. Neuroscience has also progressed dramatically over the past half century. The general advancement of science and technology is not news. But the application to an understanding of the art market is not obvious. With knowledge of how the brain works, scientists have elucidated the genius of artists in understanding visual perception. In turn, neuroscientists who study the visual system have potential to inform artistic movements and encourage the appreciation of art across the broadest possible audience. Here are a few examples. In the Renaissance, artists formalized the method of depicting a third dimension on a two-dimensional surface. In grappling with the challenge of representing depth, artists discovered how the brain reconstructs a third dimension from a two-dimensional surface. 400 years later, psychophysicists verified that artists had discovered the visual cues of foreshortening, occlusion, and perspective through which the brain perceives depth. Chiaroscuro demonstrated an understanding of the visual system's specialization for identifying contrast. Neuropsychologists have identified the ability of neurons to recalibrate under different conditions of ambient lighting so as to maintain the highest sensitivity to changes in illumination. Impressionism illustrated insight into the chaotic nature of visual information which is incident on the eye and from which the brain must extract a clear representation of the visual world. In retrospect, Impressionism also raised the question of how the brain processes the information. Subsequent movements suggest that artists had the same question. Cubists demonstrated an understanding of the brain's ability to perceive all sides of an object independent of viewing angle. Kinetic artists realized that motion itself has an aesthetic. 
and color field painters explored the discrete aesthetic of color to form. Subsequently, neuroscientists used elegant experiments and imaging technology to verify discrete areas of the brain devoted to detection of motion and color. As contemporary artists continue to seek out fundamentals of aesthetics, art becomes less knowledge and cultural specific and more likely to be appreciated independent of education and personal experience. As a result, the market for contemporary art has become transcultural and truly global. Until now, neuroscience has played the role of confirming the insight and genius of artists, but with the accessibility of knowledge of how the brain works, perhaps neuroscience will inform artistic movements. I would like to conclude by summarizing a few trends that have become clear over the past decade. In the art market, if one thinks of collecting as a combination of connoisseurship and investing, there seems to be a shift in the balance away from connoisseurship to investing. In foreign relations, the role of cultural property has expanded from a question of restitution of wartime plunder to claims for repatriation independent of the circumstances under which an object was transferred. At the same time, transnational and transcultural acquisitions of artworks is on the rise. In security, monuments are at risk of political violence and nations in political transition, such as Egypt, are at risk of looting. Also, as emerging nations invest in the promotion of contemporary art in the interest of economic development, funding for protection of cultural heritage sites remains challenged. Each of the trends has significance in its own right and the interrelation of the financial value of art, politics of cultural property, and art crime has established the political economy of the art market.